All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Good to see you all here. What we're going to do first this morning is I'm going to do a little game here with Sersha and Abriel. <clears throat> So go ahead, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read to you. Or I'm gonna say a, a, some some things, and I need you to to tell me whether it's true or not. Okay. I am a kangaroo. Is that true? How do you know I'm not a kangaroo? Okay. Have you ever seen a kangaroo before? In person? No. No. But have you have you seen a kangaroo somewhere else? So how do you know I'm not a kangaroo? Because you're a person. Because I'm a person? Okay. All right. Um, here's another one. Um, does anyone else have an, uh, an opinion about whether or not I'm a kangaroo? No. Okay. <laughs> Have any of you seen a kangaroo in person? Because I have. I've also seen Steve Irwin in person, too. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't hop around, right? Um, kangaroos hop. I don't hop. Therefore, I'm not a kangaroo. Um, OK, what else? I, I am an excellent ping pong player. Is that true or false? Do you know what ping pong is? How about this? How about how about basket? Do you know what basketball is? Okay, I am an excellent basketball player. Is that true or false? What? I am an excellent. I'm a really good basketball player. Is that true or false? True. Well, I think we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No. How do you know I'm a good basketball player? How do you know? I don't know. You don't know? Maybe okay. Because you played basketball before and you used the basketball in the basketball hoop a hundred times? Maybe, yeah. Have you but you haven't seen that, have you? So you don't know, do you? Well, I will tell you that I am not a good basketball player. Or any well. Thank you, wife, <laughs> for saying, or any sport. <laughs> Define sport. I mean, <laughs> what's that? Cup stacking. Could be. And I mean, you know, there are some strange things going on in the Olympics these days. So <laughs> I can throw a really good Frisbee. Or I can throw a Frisbee really well. That's a better way to say it. Uh, is that a sport, though? I don't know. Anyway. OK, so the point here is that it's, it's important to know what is true and what is not. And seeking truth is something that is, uh, is a skill we learn. We start to learn when we're kids. And it's a very, it's a very, basic, very basic understanding of logic and, uh, you know, uh, discerning or, or, or concluding and making decisions about what is real and what isn't, right? So um, these kids were like, okay, you're not a kangaroo because you don't look like a kangaroo. That's, that's a logical argument. Like, that's, a, that's a good argument. And I, I made the joke, kangaroos jump. Tim doesn't jump, therefore he is not a kangaroo, right? That is, that is a logical argument. I forget what kind of, of, of logical framework that is, but that's a specific type of argument. Do you have an, have an input on that, Neil? You look like you're about to... Deductive, yes. Deductive logic, correct. Um, if P, then Q, like that sort of thing, right? Okay, yeah, all right. So there's a point to it, to, to me going, going through and, and doing this based on what we're going to, to talk about today. So go ahead, um, let me get my iPad up here. We're in Acts 17. Oh, there we go. Acts 17, verse 16 through 18, 11. I don't know. I don't know that we'll get through all of of 
most, we won't get through most of, of the 18 um, verses in 18. Um, so, we, we, so we may have to save that for the next time. But um, let's go ahead and pray, and, um, and then we'll get into this week's teaching on Athens and Corinth. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Shabbat. We thank you for today. We thank you for, uh, we thank you, we here thank you for the great um, time of prayer and, and conversation we've already had today, um, for the presence of, of, of good people and that your spirit is here and that we feel it. We, we feel your spirit and, and the wisdom uh, that you would want us to, to search out is here. So we thank you for that. We ask you to bless our discussions, our time of learning uh, and uh, prayer and praise wherever we are. We thank you and bless you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Last teaching. Uh, let me just go over real quickly uh, some of the main points. Um, in At the beginning of it, we see that Paul and Barnabas kind of now have formal approval <clears throat> for all the things that they were trying to do in reaching the, the Gentiles. There's an actual official decree that frees them up from having to be the only ones going out there um, and, and doing what they're doing. That frees them to do follow-up work now, right? So they're not just going out as the tip of the spear. They can they can revisit and and and... Um, encourage the places where they have already been. <clears throat> and it also means that they're not going to be the only ones anymore. There are going to be some more men who go out <clears throat> and deliver this decree, um, likely in other places. So that's, that's good news. And Paul and Barnabas start to make their plans that include, possibly include John Mark joining the team, right? And we talked about how John Mark had quite an experience and putting ourselves in his shoes it was very humbling, and, uh, and it would have been very difficult for him in his relatively young age to grapple with the fact that his, his uncle recommending him go along on this trip is what broke up the dynamic duo of Batman and Robin. I mean, Paul and Barnabas, right? Like, that's, that's earth-shattering. That could be earth-shattering. And, and the, the idea that God wanted Mark, John Mark to go through this so that he could be prepared to be one of the gospel writers, he could be prepared to be, to be more on the front lines in Asia Minor and in Rome and in Egypt. Uh, so lots, lots to discuss there. And then we see how Timothy becomes Paul's disciple and that we see Paul's affirmation of circumcision for the Jews. Because Timothy was a Jew, um, he was uh, uh, saying basically, yes, Jewish fathers should be circumcising their Jewish sons, and it's necessary for Timothy to, uh, to repent of this omission in his life by, by doing that. Uh, and then he, he goes along with Paul. And then also talking about how we can see how God is playing the long game here. And of course, this is, we can, we can, that's not something that is, is news to us, but it's something that's good to remember uh, that, there, that there is a reason for the things we go through and that we won't know them necessarily until much later or tomorrow or at the end of our life or only when we are re returned to him after we die. So, so that's the last teaching. All right, now we're in Acts 17, verse 16, um, and uh, they are in Athens. But before I get into the text, I want to talk a little bit about uh, these philosophies and, and a few words here that, that we'll see. All right, Stoicism and Epicureanism is something that is mentioned, and it's something that we could just gloss over. This is in verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Okay, so Stoicism and Epicureanism. What I would encourage you to do, and, and my reasons I'll, I'll, I'll give later on, get a grasp of what Stoicism is. I, this is your assignment for this week. Look into and familiarize, familiarize yourself what, with what Stoicism is. Epicureanism 
is, is not a philosophy that is very prevalent at all uh, today. Um, but Stoicism, I have seen a lot of things being produced, a lot of content on social media these days about Stoicism and the writings of the Stoics. Uh, I know Marcus Aurelius was uh, uh, one of the most prolific Stoic uh, um, uh, individuals in history. Uh, there's a writer, Seneca, who wrote a lot about Stoicism, uh, but a lot of people these days, so it's, it's at least a popular fad right now, being interested in Stoicism. So it's important for us to know, I think, what it is, familiarize ourselves with this philosophy. Um, and I'll say a, just a little bit here uh, about it. Stoicism states, and, and just a fair warning, I'm not an expert on this. I read, I read a couple books. I, I pulled out my, um, my book here, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, uh, written in part by William Lane Craig, who many of you may recognize as a very prominent Christian apologist and professional philosopher. He, he was a co-writer in this. Excellent book. I've read the introduction many times. <laughs> a lot of it is, is too deep for me. It's, it's something that I would love to go through, uh, but time and um, state of life has kept me from doing that. But I pulled this out and, and, and looked through some of it. Um, so all that to say that I'm giving you some, cur I have a cursory understanding of these things. Um, I don't pretend to know more than, than that. So Stoicism, from what I can deduce, states that the practice of virtue is enough to achieve eudaimonia, a well-lived life. The Stoics identified the path to achieving it with a life spent practicing the four virtues in everyday life. Wisdom, so truth courage, temperance and, temperance and moderation, and justice, uh, and living in accordance with nature. For the Stoics, what was the, their um, virtue was determined by the order they saw in nature and not beyond. So that's, that's an important aspect of Stoicism we, need to, uh, we should be familiar with. Epicureanism bases its ethics on a hedonistic set of values, seeing pleasure, uh, but not necessarily hedonistic in the, in the terms of just being as pleasure-filled as possible. There's a, there's a kind of hedonism that is, that is just extreme. It's not that. But the pleasure being the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. That is what uh, Epicurean philosophy sets at a, as a value. That is the chief good in life. There is a publication that's been around for a long time called Epicurean that's about food. And the reason why that makes sense is because an Epicurean wants to, to experience pleasure, doesn't want to experience pain, wants to have as pain-free physically and emotionally and mentally an existence as possible. And that is what the good life is. So they will avoid things. One, one example is they will avoid, um, this is going to be funny to those of you who are married, they will avoid marriage because they do not want to, they do not want to experience pain in their life. <laughs> they're, they're, they're averse to conflict, right? So that, that's kind of an example of Epicurean. Um, hence, Epicurus, the, the, the founder of this philosophy, advocated living in such a way as to derive the greatest amount of pleasure possible during one's lifetime, yet doing so moderately in order to avoid the suffering incurred by overindulgence in such pleasure. Okay? These were the two dominant philosophies at the time of the writing of Acts, Epicureanism and Stoicism. They were the primary opponents. Okay, so those are those two words. Um, a sophist is a teacher, sophist. And then rhetoric, how many of you can have a, do you have a working understanding of what rhetoric is? Anyone? I saw you nod your head. What, what was rhetoric? Well, how would you describe it? The art of persuasion. Exactly, the art of persuasion. Um, in particular, the form of discourse, right? Rhetoric is about form. And rhetoric is different from philosophy in that philosophy is about substance. Substance and form. 
also at the same time of the, the writing of Acts and Paul being in Athens, rhetoric was something that was, had, had gained a, a, a foothold in popularity due to Aristotle a few hundred years earlier. He had kind of resurrected the idea of rhetoric as something of value. And rhetoric had, was on the rise and it was at odds with philosophy. So the form or the content. So there was this battle going on too. All of the which, all of these philosophy, Stoicism, Epicureanism, rhetoric, the use of rhetoric, uh, the, the discipline of philosophy, all of it, of course, was about what? Seeking what? Truth, wisdom, finding out what, it, what is true and, and what is wise. Right? So they all had that in common. And so they, they, because they had that at a base level, they could coexist in a place like Athens. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so rhetoric, a sophist is a, is a teacher. Uh, we have these two different philosophies that are mentioned here in the text. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start. I'm going to start at the end before we even get into the beginning of this text. So we see here where he's in Athens. Where does he go after he goes to Athens? He goes to Corinth. He goes to Corinth next, and that's in, in, in chapter 18. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read from 1 Corinthians. Because what I want you to see is where his mind was at after he left Athens. And then we're going to go back and read through this passage in Acts to see what happened that would lead to him teaching the Corinthians a certain thing about wisdom. Okay, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 17. I'll read that through chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 2, 16. So this is, again, this is, this is his, how he uh, had reacted and responded to his experience in Athens. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Messiah be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to, say those, to, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Messiah crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Messiah Yeshua, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, and so, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, so this is after he left Athens, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Messiah Yeshua and him crucified. And as I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest, may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age 
or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, with no eye, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart the, the, this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths in those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. Okay. What does he think about wisdom and lofty speech and eloquence? Right. He's, he's, he's had it, right? He's obviously had it. Uh, much of the interpretation of this passage, and we'll get into this a little later too, is he's talking about, and he flip-flops between philosophy and rhetoric. Uh, he's talking, let's see, the... Um, I didn't, uh, not with words of eloquent wisdom. So this is, I think is believed to be him talking about philosophy. And then halfway through, uh, we're not in plausible words of wisdom. I think what, what, how it's translated there is more in line with rhetoric and the form of things. And then he goes back to wisdom, um, not taught to us by human wisdom, I think is what uh, that passage was. But anyway, so I, I was reading some articles and some in a uh, uh, research paper that was basically like wisdom and rhetoric. He has a problem with, or I'm sorry, not wisdom, philosophy and rhetoric. But is it just philosophy and rhetoric? Or is it certain types of philosophy and rhetoric? Or the misuse of philosophy and rhetoric? That's kind of at, at the heart of this here. So... We can see in his letter to the Corinthians that when he arrived in Corinth from Athens, he had an adverse reaction to what had occurred there. So, let's see what occurred there. Okay. Acts 17, and I'm going to start in verse 15. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. Athens has been described as a being a city uh, containing a forest of statues. Thousands, I think the, the estimate is about 3,000 statues um, and, and edifices to gods, to um, uh, prominent figures in, in their history, just absolutely chock full of statues, of idols. They were everywhere. And because this was a polyistic society, once you allow for a multiplicity of gods, it's hard to find consensus on what the maximum number of gods is as is the case in Athens. And so including statues to the unknown gods was pretty much par for the course, right? You couldn't know them all, and everyone was so fearful of, of not offending any of the gods, so they made sure to have statues to unknown gods in the case that, that those might be upset with you too, right? So there was a bit, a bit of fear in place there. It was part and parcel uh, to this kind of... A, uh, exhaustive uh, polytheism. Okay, verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons 
and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Again, we see Paul coming to a synagogue, because that's where the word of God would be, would be proclaimed. Going there, devout persons in my translation, I don't know, what do you have in yours? I know this is in reference to God-fearers, but God-fearing Gentiles you have there. Okay, so that, that's basically who it is. So the, the Jews, God-fearers. Uh, it also says here he was in the marketplace every day. So what was Paul's profession, his vocation? Anyone? Tent maker, fabric. Uh, he, uh, being from Tarsus, Tarsus was a center of this kind of trade, and so his family business would have involved something to do with fabrics, the kind of fabric that was uh, uh, waterproof, that was used a lot in tents. So he would have set up shop wherever he was. He would have been here for a while. He would have set up shop in the marketplace to provide for himself. Uh, later on, we're going to see how he, he made it a point not to burden himself, not to burden the congregations with his support as a, as a missionary, but he liked to go and, and, and provide for himself. So he would set up shop in the marketplace, and he would just have conversations with people as he was, as he was uh, uh, exercising commerce and, and selling his wares, right? Um, the particular God-fearers here would be a, a different type than in other places he's been. And they may have come to inquire about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of the unity behind the universe that so much of the philosophical ideas of that Hellenistic society dealt in. In other words, these particular God-fearers may have been a little bit more intellectual than some other God-fearers in other places in the Gentile world. Does that, does that make sense? Like, Think of, think of going to a college town, and in a college town, there's just much more people who are appreciative of academia and, and scholarship, and so the kinds of people who are going to be going to churches and finding Messiah are going to have a different kind of bent in, in the way they think. I think that that's, that's something that's, that's a generalization, but I think that, that it's, it's safe to say that these particular God-fearers may have come to uh, an understanding or appreciation of Torah and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from an intellectual um, doorway, if that makes sense. So that's speculation, but it's, it's something to consider. This is a, 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 the first time Paul is speaking directly to Gentiles since the disastrous, disastrous events in Lystra, right, which left scars on him. He was, that's where he was stoned. Um, they didn't like him. So this is the first time we see he's actually doing this again. Um, uh, but he's also, let's not, let's not picture him as a street corner preacher here. Again, he's in the marketplace having conversations. Um, and people would engage with him, and that's just kind of what you did. So that, that, that's uh, going on too. He's not on a dais as a street corner preacher. All right, verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. So they would have come to the marketplace. Maybe they even heard about him and just wanted to talk to him. This is what you did in Athens. Uh, you would just talk about ideas. So this is, we'll see this later on in the passage as well. This, is what, this was their spectator sport, or one of them. This is one of the things that was most interesting to a lot of people, was talking about ideas. They would have heard, hey, go to the tent maker. He's got some really interesting ideas. So they would go, and they would find out. They would find out. And some, of, so, some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Yeshua and the resurrection. All right. What does this babbler say? What does your translation say there in verse 18? What does, instead of babbler, babbler in yours? Babbler, okay. Another version I know said... Another version I know said seed picker. Like, so it was a derogatory term, uh, but in those days, in that place, having that kind of derogatory term uh, is what you did when you would belittle someone's rhetorical skill. Again, this is a society of people who valued good speech, good communication, rhetoric, philosophy, ideas, communication. And... They were practiced at it for a long time. They were passionate about it, uh, and they had experience in it. Paul um, wouldn't have had nearly as much experience in it, and certainly not as much passion about it. But he had some ideas, 
And so they were listening to him, but they were judging the way he was talking by calling him a babbler or a seed picker or whatever it is. So this was a derogatory term. They were, they were judging his, the form in which his words took. And then here it says, you know, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. It's important to note that it was unlawful to introduce new gods in Athens at that time. It was against the law. It was a crime. Probably because there was just so many anyway. <laughs> it would have been more of a burden to say, oh, we got another one? Okay, you know, ah, all right. So I don't know. That's, that's uh, making light of it. But that was against the law. And Paul's audience in the marketplace um, as he was conducting business, heard something that might be considered a crime as he was speaking. So they naturally brought him to the place where the most important conversations about truth happened in Athens. He was not put on trial formally, but there was a hearing uh, uh, requested, right? So we understand what the difference between a trial and a hearing is. A hearing, you go before a body, a legislative body, to give your testimony and then it's determined whether or not something else has to happen. So this is basically what was happening. It wasn't a formal trial. Verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. They're doing some detective work. They're like, okay, this better not be what I think it is, but go ahead, speak. You have the floor. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Again, here we, here we have evidence that this society is one that liked to talk about ideas. They liked to you know, sharpen each other by how they were talking about things. They may even, they may even swap arguments and try to defend the other position just so that they could be better at debate and, and rhetoric and, and, and thinking philosophically, right? So this is a very robust intellectual um, culture. Okay, so now, um, Rebecca, could you pass out those, these sheets here? <clears throat> So this was one of the, one of the downloads. Uh, this is Paul's discourse at the Areopagus. Um, and it has, what I've done is I've borrowed some uh, headings for, for some of the text from Daniel Lancaster. Um, and so while, while this is being passed out and while you watching are getting this out to look at, I just want to mention again, I've mentioned this before at the beginning of this whole series, I'm using Chronicles of the Apostles as my primary text for, for research and study, just so you know, by Daniel Lancaster and First Fruits of Zion. This is an excellent, excellent resource. And so I'm using this every week as a primary source for what it is I'm teaching. Just want you to know that. So, um, But these headings for the different verses here are uh, Daniel Lancaster's. Okay, so let's go ahead and read through. And this is, so, so you have to remember, this is at the Areopagus, which actually wasn't a, a place so much as a, as a body, and they met in a, they met in a certain uh, place, I call it the, the Stoa Basilica or something like that, I can't remember. Um, this is the place to give a speech. Like, this is the most important place in a place that's known for discourse and communication. This is a big deal. And Paul would have known this because he would have been here already for some weeks. He had set up shop, he'd discussed, he'd learned about the culture. He probably knew that, that, that it was against the law to be te teaching about new gods. He would have known that by this point. So he's, he's aware of the importance and the weight of being asked to come to the Areopagus to present your ideas, right? So this is a big deal. This is like, this isn't a... a, a a perfect equivalent, but this would be like you have a new idea and someone calls you up from TEDx and says, we would like you to come to and speak, speak at TEDx at the main stage in wherever it is in Europe. Like, uh, and I have to keep it to like 12 minutes, you know, like, like, okay, right, I got to prepare for this, right? So he's calling on all of his, all of his skill as a, as a teacher, as a speaker, to present something to this body of people who've gathered. All right. Verse 22. 
So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all aspects. <clears throat> For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. But therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Okay, so here's something very brilliant he's doing here. Here Paul is saying, no, 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 this is not a new God I speak of. So he's already saying, this is not a crime, Your Honor. And I know that would be a crime. This, what I'm doing is I'm simply identifying the God you call unknown. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. It's, it's, it's important to note that even though they observed and practiced uh, this polytheism, many of the philosophers and rhetoricians did not believe in, in polytheism. And they rejected the idea that uh, a, a God could be worshipped that was made by hands. An invented God is not a God, right? A God that you can create yourself is not a God. So these philosophers, these, these people who were thinking people, would have rejected this idea, even though they still practiced culturally this polytheism. So he's, what he's doing here is he's appealing He's integrating some of what he knows they believe with what he believes. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Here he's being careful not to dismiss himself from their consideration by referencing anything from a Jewish context. All of what he's saying is found in the Hebrew Scriptures but he does not say, the Bible says, <laughs> the Torah says, he's God, right? He's being careful not to do that. He knows the message. He, he is there for a while in the marketplace, selling his wares. He's talking to the people. He gets a feeling for what it is they know about, tr about true wisdom, about God. And he tailors his message so that they do not just outright reject him. And here he is at the place where this kind of all culminates. Verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Paul is making an argument here, and this might be what is, what is a, a new idea to them, and something that I call, and I, I should trademark this, but I call it the one, one, all, one, one argument. Hashtag Tim's philosophy thoughts. <laughs> Copyright 2024, <laughs> Akron, Ohio. No. The one, one, all, one, one argument. One God created all people through one man. And through one man, God brings all things back to himself. So one, one, all, one, one. Okay? Perhaps. But that, that, that's what I see when, I, when I'm reading this. Which is a philosophical argument. It's something that that's, a lot of these guys would have been like, oh, that's interesting. One, one, all like, oh, okay, yeah, I see, da, 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 right? Their, their minds have been, would have been going a million miles an hour. Verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And let's see, what does this other translation say? Um, that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So it's kind of like a, Blind, fumbling around for things. Because God's creation is God's testimony to himself, is one of his testimonies to himself, it is possible to perceive him in it, but it's still an incomplete grasp of him, so to speak. 
we were talking about this earlier in here. Um, when, you, when you don't go beyond the natural world, anything that is beyond the natural to explain what you're experiencing is hard to incorporate. It's hard to, to, to grasp. So if you, can only, if you can only observe things through the senses, you can only get so far. Uh, but God's, te- and, and nature and the, the creation, everything matter, all this stuff is, is his testimony. It's part of the picture, part of the story, part of the ways we can experience him. And it gets you far, but not, not all the way, right? Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own prophets or poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Okay, these two are quotes. They are Stoic poets. He's quoting here. The first one, in him we live and move and have our being, is a quote from Epimenides. And the second, for we are indeed his offspring, he would have been recalling a line of, uh, written by Aratus. So the Stoics would have been very interested in the concept of God's intrinsic nature, in the, the, the inherent nature of God in the things around us. In him we live and move and have our being. Like that would have piqued their interest. Like, oh, okay, yes, I agree with that. I believe that, right? And he was quoting these two Stoic poets to make that association or that inter- in, in, integration, which is a philosophical and rhetorical skill. Paul is, is, is using these abilities, this, this skill set, in order to, to craft his message. Remember, he was wise not in uh, referen- not, he was wise not to reference scripture still, because his audience did not share a belief in the authority of scripture, right? That, that's, that's key here. If you're, if you're gonna be a good communicator, um, not even debater, like none of Many of us are never going to be debating the existence of God, but we may have conversations where we need to understand the other person, where they're coming from, what they believe, and how it is what we believe can be integrated into that to bring them along toward an understanding of God. Also to note that Paul was likely one of the many disciples that Gamaliel uh, required to read Greek literature so that they could engage with the Roman government. There was a certain subset of students Gamaliel had that he poured into them in a Greek way, so he would have had more than a basic knowledge of these, these present dominant philosophies like Stoicism and Epicureanism, and he would have, he would have been familiar with Epimenides and Eratus and and all these, uh, and Aristotle too, all these, all, these, all these folks. He would have had an understanding. Uh, the sent out ones, the apostles, were also very familiar with the Torah, their proof text, right? So if we're going to make a, an argument, we have to have a proof text. He is avoiding using the scripture as a proof text because he knows that they do not consider it authoritative. So he's not using his own proof text as a proof text in these conversations. And other apostles and sent ones would also have, you know, a a very solid grounding in scripture and uh, uh, what they would then do is they would strengthen their understanding with a grasp of other dominant philosophies of the day. That was something that was um, not unusual. And it's something that we've kind of lost in our modern day faith. It's kind of an, uh, what's what some people call an anti-intellectualism in, in Christianity. Uh, maybe not so much in Judaism, but in Christianity, there's a rejection of philosophy and um, all these types of, of uh, intellectual pursuits that's really unfortunate. Um, and I think that I would encourage you to not embrace that anti-intellectualism uh, in, in your faith. Okay, verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. This is another brilliant statement given his audience because there were many Greek philosophers that did not believe in the dominant polytheism around them, even though they they practice it. So I already made that point earlier, but he's again appealing to them. In this polytheistic society, which is very much enforced, he knows that many of his hearers, 
they don't, they don't actually believe that. But you know, so it's like, okay, yeah. Why, why we ought not to think that the divine being could be contained uh, in gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of a man. An invented God is not God. A created creator is not God, right? Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which we, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, so the one, one, all one, whom he has appointed, and, at, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here is where Paul lost most of them. Paul was doing his very best to incorporate good rhetorical st style with his knowledge of their philosophies, using logic, epistemology, metaphysics, apologetics, polemics, etc., probably holding his own okay, he's probably doing okay. But at the end of the day, he could not avoid the important truth about the one man through whom the world would be judged and that that one man would raise from the dead. Even with all that Paul said that would have resonated with each member of the audience for different reasons, the end point was still far too Jewish. And the whole of it was thrown out because Judaism insists on a literal translation of Scripture. That was thought to be primitive, archaic, superstitious, and beneath them. Verse 32, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some, some, mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. So some thought it was ridiculous and completely dismissed it, while others their interest was still piqued. Nevertheless, he didn't return uh, as a, as a follow up to speak more on the subject. Verse thirty three. So Paul went from their sight, went from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And because of time, uh, I'm not going to get into eighteen this week. But let me just I want to stop here now and share an excerpt from. Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview that deals, uh, I think, very much with this passage and, and why we see Paul in 1 Corinthians reacting the way he did and writing about, basically about his experience in the way he did. Okay, this is from chapter one, I believe, of uh, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. What he does here is, what the authors do here is that they, um, they're going to, uh, in this portion, they're going to write down some of the claims or some of the reasons why philosophy and rhetoric, uh, especially philosophy, is rejected by mainstream Christianity in this, in this kind of anti-intellectualism that we are still currently in. He's got four Four, they have four points, and the fourth point I'm going to read a little bit more about. Not, not very much, it's not much. There are at least four reasons frequently cited for such an attitude of hostility, of, of philosophy being hostile to the faith. Number one, first the claim is made that human depravity has made the mind so darkened that, the, that sin's effects on the mind render the human intellect incapable of knowing truth. That's number one. Number two, second, it is sometimes claimed that faith and reason are hostile to each other, and whatever is of reason cannot be of faith. Okay? All of these they dispute, by the way. Third, some cite Colossians 2.8 as evidence against philosophy. Quote, so to it, or see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than of Christ. That's the NIV. What's important to note here is that when he's talking about philosophy, he's got qualifiers, hollow and deceptive. If he was just talking about philosophy, he would have said philosophy. But he's not making a, a characterization of philosophy in general. He's saying hollow and deceptive philosophy. So that's, that was the point that they're, how they uh, debunked that. Finally, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, which we read earlier, it is cited as evidence against philosophy. 
Here, Paul argues against the wisdom of the world and reminds his readers that he did not visit them with persuasive words of wisdom. But again, this passage must be understood in context. For one thing, if it is an indictment against argumentation and philosophical reason, then it contradicts Paul's own practices in Acts. Remember, every time he goes to a new place, he caters his message, incorporating the philosophy of the people there, whether he is relying more on their naturalistic understanding and calling uh, uh, to mind that God created everything, all the world around them, or if he's appealing to some other thing that is prevalent, a prevalent idea in their culture. So he's, he does it. He uses philosophy and rhetoric. Um, and his explicit appeal to argument and evidence on behalf of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. It also contradicts other passages like 1 Peter 3.15, as well as the practice of Old Testament prophets and preachers. We see it, we see it all over the place. The passage is better seen as a condemnation of the false, prideful use of reason, not of reason itself. It is hubris that is in, that is in view, not the mind. The passage may also be con condemnation of Greek rhetoric. Greek orators prided themselves in possessing persuasive words of wisdom, and it was their practice to persuade a crowd of any side of an issue for the right price. They did not base their persuasion on rational considerations, but on speaking ability. Again, who is this babbler, right? They're already judging him on how he's talking and not considering what it is he's saying. Thus bypassing issues of substance. Paul is most likely contrasting himself with Greek rhetoricians. Paul could also be making the claim that the content of the gospel cannot be deduced from some set of first principles by pure reason. Thus, the gospel of salvation could never have been discovered by philosophy, but had to be revealed by the biblical God who acts in history. So the passage may be showing the inadequacy of pure reason to deduce the gospel from abstract principles, not its ability to argue for the truth. Does that make sense? That's, that's a pretty good understanding. Over the past several days, I have spent way too much time on YouTube watching debates. How many of you like to do that? A little bit, right? How many of so I've watched debates. These were uh, atheists versus uh, Christians. Though I did watch one of an atheist and a, and a and a Jewish rabbi. Atheists and Christians debating the existence of God, or God and, and science, or um, can science explain everything? And there was a Christian and an atheist there. And so the atheists I watched were um, Bertrand Russell, Richard Dawkins, Peter Atkins, and Christopher Hitchens. So those four guys in a couple different contexts. The creationists or the, or the believers were William Lane Craig, John Lennox, who if you don't know John Lennox, what a great speaker. He's Irish too, and so everything he says just sounds so much better, right? Like, how could you lose an argument with a wonderful Irish accent and a smiley face? He looks like a happy grandpa. Anyway, John Lennox, um, uh, William Lane Craig. Um, uh, uh, Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was one of them as well, and... Cops, Copstone, Copstone. It was the Bertrand Russell Copstone debate, um, which was a very advanced debate, and I, I couldn't follow it. Um, anyway, watched several of these debates. And I'm not, again, I'm not an expert. I, I, I read the introduction and first chapter of Philosophical Foundations of a Christian Worldview, so I'm not an expert on, on this subject. But I can, I could discern something when watching these debates. And this is what I discerned, and it's kind of what we talked about a little bit when I was mentioning something about the boiling water here earlier that you guys didn't see. But everything breaks down for an atheist or someone who is, is steeped in naturalistic philosophy. That is, there is nothing beyond nature. Everything breaks down for them in their understanding when a Christian or a believer brings something to the argument, and that something is revelation. 
outside revelation that they could not possibly discern or observe in the natural world. There are certain things that God had to reveal himself. The example I gave earlier was an example that John Lennox likes to use a lot, and that's the, the uh, metaphor of the boiling water. So if I put before you, and I already did it with them, so I'm just do this for you guys watching. If I put before you a pot of water boiling, and I asked you, why is it boiling? You might, you might intuit, well, there's a lot of reasons why there might, there might be boiling. Like, okay, well, just start, just start thinking about a reason why the water is boiling. Like, well, there's a scientific reason having to do with heat transfer and, and molecules and electricity and gas and all this. Uh, there's, a, there's other, uh, maybe more, Maybe there's a historical explanation for this, looking at what has happened in the past and what could be happening now as a reason why. There is a psychological reason, uh, all these different natural sciences and, 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 and whatnot to explain why. But what they didn't know and couldn't possibly know through observation or discerning through the senses is what my desire was for that water. And that I just wanted a cup of tea. I had to reveal that. I had to enter in and reveal that information to them for them to know the purpose of it, the real why of, of it. Not that any of those other explanations weren't true. They were all true. They were all still true. But revelation, something that was me giving a personal account, God giving his personal account, here is why. This is the revelation in the form of Yeshua and the resurrection, especially, here is why. That's where, that's where in all of these debates, I see them break down. Richard Dawkins, especially, and Christopher Hitchens, they, they devolve into kind of a, a, a petty dismissal. And I think this is what was probably going on in Athens as well, when Paul brought up this one man who was going to raise from the dead and save us all. Like, that's not something that they could have even considered as naturalistic intellectual people using only what they could observe. It just couldn't compute. And they did not want for there to be anything outside of that. Does that make sense? So revelation is, is the key here. And it's, why, it's probably why most Christians would say, don't bother with philosophy and rhetoric. And why, we, and why a lot of Christians would interpret 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 as Paul saying, do not do philosophy and rhetoric. No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, that can only get you so far, but it doesn't get you all the way. Especially the misuse of it, a prideful use of rhetoric, as if the form of the thing is the end in and of itself, and doesn't matter what you're arguing, what the substance is, that's, that's, that's useless, right? Or even if it's good substance, it still doesn't incorporate revelation from God, so it can't be complete. Corinth is not very far from Athens. So Corinth would be, have, have been influenced by this kind of culture and these values. And so he's trying to say, look, like bad philosophy, bad rhetoric, it may be better not to, to involve yourself in those things, maybe. But it still can bring people along. We see here. Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris. There were some here who, when he used his rhetorical skill, his philosophical understanding of things, they were brought to Messiah. They were brought to Torah. It worked for some. Later on, Paul writes that he was all things to all men. This is what I think he's talking about. And each audience he not only understood what he was talking about, so we as believers need to know what we're talking about, and it's why we keep going back and back to these Torah portions all the time. We keep coming back to Scripture over and over and saying the same things over and over and rehashing these, these concepts and ideas because we need to know what we're talking about. Not only that, but he took the time to get to know what the philosophies were of the people around him so that he could then integrate what was eternally true and full and complete into what they, the, the limited picture that they had where they were. Does that make sense? That, that I think, is, is, is the takeaway here for us. We continue to dig in and really know what it is we're talking about as far as Scripture goes and do our best. 
knowing that there's grace. Do your best. Understand what you're talking about. But do not shy away from understanding and seeking out where there is divine truth in some of these other philosophies so that you can make the connection with people. Be like, you believe that? Yeah, I believe that too. A lot of these debates, especially John Lennox, he is so gracious in his debates. He'll, he will be the first to say, yes, I agree with you, Richard Dawkins, on some of these things. Like, yes, we, we have common ground. You just don't think that there, that there was a man who raised from the dead, right? Or you can't understand why God would allow bad things to happen to good people, or whatever. Like there, there's, there's like these cursory things around it, right? But we have to be gracious and be able to connect with those who may not even know they believe a certain philosophy by name. Like there might be people who are out there who are Stoics, who have no idea they're Stoics, but they've heard some ideas and they believe it and they live it out. Get to know Get to know what they believe. Listen for understanding. Not, don't try to listen to respond. I think that's, that's kind of a key, that is a key uh, uh, skill that we as royal priests need to, to be better at. We need to be listening to understand others instead of listening to respond. Because people will shut you down. That, that would have happened if Paul said, yeah, but the Bible says that Y'all are going to hell, <laughs> or whatever. I mean, he wouldn't have said that, but that, that, that immediately closed the door, and he was not about closing doors. He was about keeping them open and welcoming people and doing his level, dead-level best, and he probably sweated it doing his best to try to engage people where they were with what they understood so he could bring them to a fuller understanding uh, and, and get them on the road to being part of the kingdom of God. Yeah. I can learn quite a bit about you through observation and deduction, comparison, but until you reveal yourself to me, I can only go so far. The same is true with God. I can deduce things, you can deduce things about me, but until I tell you that I'm not good at basketball, you would have had no way, well, no, you probably would have found out by observation, <laughs> But unless I reveal something to you about me personally, about my personal truth, not personal truth, sorry, that's a, that's a trigger word there, um, <laughs> about, my, about something that is true about me personally, until I reveal that to you, you can't know me. And the same is true about us engaging with others as well. We can deduce, we can categorize, we can imply or observe, but until they reveal themselves to us, we won't know. The same is true for God. And that's, I think, the big lesson here. And what Paul was trying to teach the people in Corinth. Rhetoric and philosophy can only get you so far. Um, the rest is, the rest, the, the, what is left is for God to reveal to us. And he already did a long time ago. So it's not like we're waiting on him to reveal it to us. Okay. Any comments or questions about that? Good stuff? Yeah. And just so you know who are watching, we have a Greek in the audience too, so he's nodding his head a lot, verifying everything I'm saying about the Areopagus philosophy, rhetoric, all that kind of stuff. And he just said opa, so I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, and we have some people going to Greece here in, in the spring. Um, so anyway, all right. It is 12.15. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll um, do the blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you. For your word, we thank you for the courage uh, and discipline of Paul um, and the kind of man you made him to be so that he could have this kind of experience. And we thank you for Luke who wrote it down so that we could learn from it uh, and, and discern what it is we are to, who it is we to, are to be like, what kinds of followers of Yeshua we are to be. We thank you for those men. And we thank you for the men who, uh, the people who traveled with them too. We thank you for the, the gracious audience that they had. Um, we thank you for them, that they, that they allowed for this to happen instead of just simply throwing them in the jail. Oh, I, I, I keep going with gratitude for all of the, how, how everything transpired there. I thank you for the Corinthians, um, for their desire to know you. Um, and any other, all the other congregations to which Paul was writing constantly. And those letters that we may never read that were sent and not 
protected and kept. So we thank you and bless you and thank you for this sunshiny Shabbat here in Northeast Ohio. We praise you and, and um, pray all of this in Yeshua's name. Amen.